On the podcast today, we are going to dissect chapter 27 of the Tao Te Ching. And as usual, Guy Young will read Jia Fu Feng and Jane English's translation, and I will read Derek Lin's translation. A good walker leaves no tracks. A good speaker makes no sleeps. A good reckoner needs no tolly. A good door needs no lock. Yet no one can open it. Good binding requires no knots. Yet no one can loosen it. Therefore the wise take care of everyone and abandon no one. They take care of all things and abandon nothing. This is called following the light. What is a good person? The teacher of a bad person. What is a bad person? A good person's charge. If the teacher is not respected and the student not cared for, confusion will arise, however clever one is. This is the crux of mystery. Good traveling does not leave tracks. Good speech does not seek faults. Good reckoning does not use counters. Good closure needs no bar and yet cannot be opened. Good knot needs no rope and yet cannot be untied. Therefore sages often save others and also do not abandon anyone. They often save things and so do not abandon anything. This is called following enlightenment. Therefore the good person is the teacher of the bad person. The bad person is the resource of the good person. Those who do not value their teachers and do not love their resources, although intelligent, they are greatly confused. This is called the essential wonder. This chapter is about the responsibility of the sage and their impartial view and also about how they behave as a result of being in harmony with the Tao. Yes. Yes, in the first part, the good, being a good walker, good speaker, good reckoner, and good door. All these um, things, metaphors, are symbolizing the, a sage, the wise one, or we could also say a wise leader or something like that, has, doesn't leave anything behind. Mm. Through, all throughout the Tao Te Ching, we see many chapters about how we should emulate the sages. And this is another one. This is about how we ad- absorb our responsibility as people who follow the Tao as well and our responsibility to the actual impartial view. And a lot of people uh, forget that Taoism is about having that impartial view. That's why all throughout the Tao Te Ching we see representations of high and low, beautiful and ugly, you know, the polarities of life, the yin mm. and yang yes. of life. Yeah, here uh, mentioning about the following the light, yes. Mm. So the a sage, the wise one following that light, a light here in, in actually actual Chinese writing of this uh, chapter, the light uh, is Ming, is, and that actually the actual writing the characters uh, combining both two different characters and they are a sun and the moon and they combine together making the ming the light means ming so the light of the sun and the moon both mm. and the, the light of the yang and the sun uh, and the yin you could also say so light of sun and the moon so the not one sided perception here Yep. It's following that light, it's following that impartial perception. Yes. And in Chinese, there's also uh, the word shen ming. Yes. So the spirit, the, the undifferentiated spirit, before the jing, the, our essence, our, even our genetic essence, mm. and also, you know, also our qi. So you have shen ming, which is this sort of brightness that the sage has where it's the perfect unison of yin and yang Mm. together Mm. so not yang or yin it's yin and yang Yang. together as mutually dependent interdependent opposites yes yes and that's the process that we all go through in absorbing the Tao and, and allowing the Tao to move through us But that's in the dissolution of our identity for allow that to happen, is to dissolve our identity, to allow the Tao to move through us and use us as it sees fit, not Mm. how we see fit as a a persona. Mm. And so that's what Shen Ming is, right? The sage has Shen Ming, has this this brightness 
and as you said with Ming, you know that that light, mm. and so the the dissolution of opposites has resolved within the sage. Yes, is that um, transcending the idea of who you think you are, isn't it? it getting to that realm of um, perception, yep. impartial view. Yep. So again, th that's what this chapter is talking about. That's the impartial view. What a sage. What a teacher in this case also has, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And to mention here, saying like good person, what is a good person? What is a bad person? And things like that. So again, sages in sages' perspective, of course, there is no good person or a bad person, right? Again, because that light, the impartial view. So here is not to distinct which are good people or bad people right mm. and and again that doesn't mean also you ne you necessarily you need to like everyone here either no. because like liking somebody is also somewhat like a coming from that person place right and from that perspective mm. it's about whether others are following the path of the Tao or not mm. and leading the way as the wise person. Mm. But again, here not to say that you are always right or you are always mm. the wiser than everyone else, yeah. right? It's more so having that impartial view and have, coming from that higher perspective, you are kind of leading the way as becoming one with the Tao, the guiding the way which others can see and follow. Mm. Mm. And that's because they have that impartial view, right? That's why we gravitate towards the sage because they don't have opinions of right or wrong or who is good or bad. And the problem, again, with translations, particularly in English, is for Westerners, they'll take this chapter far too literal when we, they see the word good and bad yeah because then they start to think well yeah we, we do have a concept of who are bad people and who are good people and lots of kind of talking about that here in this chapter but as you alluded to it's not not exactly the the case no you know he's it's talking about who are the followers of Tao and those who have forgot the Tao right is more of an accurate representation because most people in the world have forgot the Tao and there are very few who remember the Tao and, and actually come into alignment with that because they start to let go of control in their life and they allow life to be as it will. Mm -hmm. And again, this brings into the argument, the concept of free will, you know, who has free will. And from a personal perspective, mm -hmm. as an ego, we think we have free will. But as we've been discussing... The Tao is what's doing us. Mm -hmm. We have the egocentric view of our own subjectivity. So we think it's you know, it's us doing us. You yeah. know? And as Alan Watts once famously said, do you do it or does it do you? Yeah. And that's what Alan was talking about. And this is a fundamental concept within Eastern spirituality because if we look into Shaivism in India particularly, like Sh Shiva's will is actually your will and it's about letting go and allowing Shiva's will to be your energy so to speak yes. and it's only in letting go that we come into alignment with that greater power the ultimate source no matter whether it's Hinduism Buddhism or Taoism that that is kind of a, a fundamental thread mm -hmm. that we find within all of the great traditions and even Jainism and, and even in Sikhism yes that's how we reach uh, this concept of complete or perfection right mm -hmm. like not the we think of what they are mm -hmm. it's a more so a state state of mind where you as a person disappear and when you give it up to the way the Tao then Tao is doing it Tao mm. is doing you mm. so that everything becomes complete as it is. Yep. That's the perfection, 
Exactly. As as they are. Yeah. Mm. And Derek uses essential wonder and Jaffa Fang and Jane English use mystery in, in talking what we're talking about. That, that, that great essential wonder is that we are all a localization of that oneness of Tao. And we are all on a journey together. We're having a subjective experience of that, that feeling of subjectivity. Yeah. And because we're on that journey together as one with the Tao, whether we want to believe that or not, we are either we are we are helping each other sometimes unconsciously on the path and we're also hindering some people on the path sometimes as you were alluding to like sometimes we think we are uh, the good person we always want to assume that we are the good person but in sometimes through other people's eyes we may be the bad person yes. and there is this fluctuation but the point here is is that we're all on the one journey together mm. And we're either in some sense helping each other or we're hindering each other at times. Mm -hmm. But it's all the Tao expressing itself and moving towards the greater totality. And the the job for us on an individual subjective level is analogous to the river moving towards the ocean, the great oneness of the ocean. Mm -hmm. As, as, As a river, we have form... We have a sort of a stream that we follow. But if, and I've used the river analogy constantly throughout the podcast, if we begin to let go of the banks of the river or stop fighting the current, then that river's power becomes our power and it takes us yeah. effortlessly to that great ocean. Mm. And that's what the is. Mm. The is that virtue of the non, the virtue of the non virtuous. Yes. You're not trying to be virtuous, but. Mm inadvertently you become virtuous as a sage does not through trying Mm. but just from letting go yes and that's what it actually means to be in harmony with the Tao is to follow that path of letting go and letting go of this these control issues that we have Mm. as an individual subject subjective person yes yeah we i mean like most of us if not everyone want to be always you know in the right side mm. we don't want to be wrong right mm. uh, but not not necessarily that you are conscious of not being trying not being wrong always being right it's just kind of like it's our um natural respond response to everything mm. but in saying that we cannot always be right mm. just accepting we can al- also be sometimes wrong because there's just nature of things, like, yep. you, and again, that is kind of um, a mutuality of life. That it just that's just how things are, and accepting the fact, right? Yep. Accepting that we can sometimes be wrong, mm-hmm. and again, like from the place as a person, you always want to be right in a sense, but accepting that. You can also be wrong. And again, right and wrong, there is no good or bad kind of quality. Again, that you're mutually arising. There's a mutuality of nature, of life, right? Mm -hmm. And when you can uh, stay in that place of uh, non-partial perspective, then you don't think about being right or wrong anymore, Mm -hmm. right? You, yeah. Yeah, the, the the one who really follows the Tao has forgotten about the Tao itself, right? Mm. You coming from that uh, a little bit more elevated um, pers- perspective. Yeah, and a sage is willing to put their hand up if maybe they may have offended someone. Mm. Maybe you know, I mean, people are too overly sensitive these days, obviously, but uh, they are willing because they don't have that real concept. <laughs> solidified concept of what is right or wrong and again right or wrong according to who yeah you know i was going to mention this example throughout the week there was a uh, rugby league player in australia brian toho who chose to play for samoa in the world cup at the end of the year over australia and a lot of people in australia got mad about it because you know he grew up here and everything and, mm. and he's even his parents want him to play for australia but he wanted to be honest to his culture and or heritage, really, like of his grandparents and everything like that. 
And what I liked what Brian said throughout the week, he, he kind of, not that he apologised, he said he's, he's sorry if he offended anyone in Australia with his actions, but it's important for him to represent where his parents' parents are from and, mm. and that sort of culture. And so that's a, a, an example of who's right or wrong here. And again, a lot of the hysteria is just around the stupidity of social media, which is a whole other story. But when you take a step back and you look at just the whole landscape of it, no one is right or wrong. Okay, some Australian people are mad about it, but he's doing what he feels is right for himself. And that's not good or bad. No. It's neither. And, and that's always what the sages are talking about. They're always talking about what do you think that's actually wrong? Like, what do you think that's right? Mm. Is that just based on your own conditioning? Do you have an agenda? And obviously with that example I had, there's plenty of agendas bent going around <laughs> back and forth. So a sage is impartial. So in being impartial, they don't have an agenda. They don't have two, their own two cents to throw on any sort of situation, their own opinion. They're, in some sense, opinionless. Mm. And that's why we actually turn to them. That's why they have Shen Ming. They have that br- brightness. They have the De, that charismatic virtue power. Yes. And that's why we turn to them. Nowadays, uh, with uh, social media and whatnot, uh, people love arguing. Mm. Just get into debate on little things, little topics, and just they find anything to argue over, right? Mm. Mm. And try to... Uh, cross their point over and try to prove that they are right, their opinion is superior than others. But again, that uh, I think we, it almost kind of became like a cultural trend having a debate and arguing over tiniest thing nowadays Mm. and just to prove they're right and again, we all know that's coming from where very, very like low place yep. is not uh, ha- that place. From that place, you don't have a bigger perspective. You don't have um, knowledge of how nature works and whatnot, mm. because it's all about uh, to prove how you know mm. how superior you are than others. Yep. But again, like Dao's perspective is to understand that, that like the very last line in this chapter is this is a crux of mystery. Mm-hmm. Meaning that having the good or bad, like a, the opposite places, like having a good or, or bad and um, yeah, right or wrong kind of uh, perspectives are equally has equal value mm. in the universe's perspective, I think. Yeah. And w- whatever you value is better or worse, it, it doesn't really matter in the end. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of just crux of mystery of the Tao. Yeah. It's got nothing to, you know, prove what's wrong or what's right. No. Well, the opposites, we have to always remember if, for those no matter whether you're a Taoist or into a spirituality, are, are actually mutual. Yeah. They're mutual opposites. And this comes from the birth of the universe where we have the polarities mm-hmm. of yin and yang. So, And I've described the Taoist metaphysics for people a lot, but I'll describe it briefly again, where you have Wu Qi, the origin of the universe, which is Tao in stillness or emptiness or nothingness. And then... The first movement of energy coming out is, is Tai Chi, which is Tao in motion, in movement. All of the energy we have, which then gives birth to yin and yang, the polarities of the world. And the, the process for people sincere and following a Tao is about bringing those yin and yang within ourselves back into harmony, resolving them as one because they are mutual opposites which then you reverse the movement of Tai Chi back into Uchi, mm. back into the origin. And that's when the Tao can use you because then you're an empty vessel. You're, Uchi is your nature then. Mm. You're an empty vessel and then the, the Tao's energy just moves through you. And the idea of you doesn't really exist anymore. Yes. 
And so you are doing it then. It's, you know, I mean, it's doing you and you are kind of doing it. It's both the same, mm -hmm. you know. So, and, and that's the point of, of resolving, mm -hmm. of bringing those uh, opposites back together. And so the thing is that we ought not to hold to yin or yang. And that's what a lot of people do. Even when they come across uh, Taoism, they think, well, I'm just going to learn uh, Yang Tai Chi Juan, for example. Mm -hmm. And just, and you're all young then, and you don't know anything about yin. And as people who have read my books would know, especially from reading Fast in the Mind, we live in a yin deficient world yeah. where we don't access enough yin. And Lao Tzu actually states in the Tao Te Ching that we need to stick to the yin and use the yang conservatively. That's actually how the balance of energy actually works between yin and yang. So we, we abide in stillness, we abide in calm and presence and peace. Mm -hmm. And when action is required, we act efficaciously. Mm -hmm. Our actions are purified then. We're, because if we're all young, we're not calm and we're not thinking properly. And so we're just doing things and we're out and we cause chaos. Mm -hmm. And that's the point is, is that you, you shouldn't stick to one or the other. You need to result. You need to bring both back into harmony, and that's what the essence of that Tai Chi symbol is. Making that perfect balance between the two opposites, and that's where the steel point is. That's the returning to the Wu Qi. Yeah. There is the movement of energy, which is Tai Chi. But it, it will always happen. But in the end, the, the essence of that movement itself is Uchi, is that still point, the still point of the Tao. Yes. And that is the, again, the sages, uh, where sages stand. Mm. And that's where we should all stand as well. One of the most famous verses in the Zhuangzi text is when there is no more this and that, you reside in the still point of the Tao. And the whole Zhuangzi text is an effort by Zhuangzhou and the other authors that came after him to re-emphasize the importance of the impartial view. And so that's why when you read the Zhuangzi, it's all about impartiality. And that's why he continually destroys the Confucian narrative at the time. He can continually destroys the Moist narrative at the time. Mm. And so you've got this constant destruction of these other f f uh, philosophical schools during the Warring States period. And, and Zhuangzi is kind of the pinnacle in some sense of Taoism because he came after Lao Tzu and learned a lot about the Tao Te Ching and, and learned about the Tao going back many years and put it into a context where we really hone in on what it means to be impartial in the world. Mm. And even in that time, Conf so let's say Confucianism and Maoism were not much different to a lot of the schools of thought that we have today. The schools of thought, I mean, in controlling society, mm. you know, no matter what it is today. Mm. And that's what Zhuangzi was pulling apart at that time. Another thing Zhuangzi harped on about as well, and that this, this chapter actually alludes to, is how to live our life skillfully and that's what the the first section of this chapter is about how to go through life without causing any disruptions to life and being that wise responsible leader now in saying that heavy lies the burden right yes. to, to live your life efficaciously to go through life where you you have success in life so to speak but you leave no tracks mm. of your success behind you uh, so you're a successful person in the human sense with the qualities of humility, compassion, forgiveness. You exude peace without intentionally doing so. Yes. And the problem for the teachers or the sages or any of us following the way or who are interested in Eastern spirituality is people begin then to turn to you as someone who may have some more knowledge than what they do. Or may have some sort of wisdom. And this is where this chapter sort of pinpoints our responsibility as followers of the Tao. Yes. Um, I mean, as a, we all, as an individual, 
we sometimes experience that sort of um, burden and responsibility. Sometimes uh, uh, it lies heavier than not. And, but I think it's all about to teach us how to be uh, how to be um, stay how to stay strong on the path and having again impart from having impartial perspective, giving more compassionate eyes on others and staying humble, mm. isn't it? Like it is sometimes uh, become a bit of a lonely place as well because um, it don't seem to easy to find like-minded other individuals. It sometimes feels you like uh, you're alone doing this work. It's not really a work, but it does sometimes feel like it because we have to, I mean, we got to be honest. Sometimes we uh, look at how others behave. You just kind of shake your head sometimes, you know, like it's just a natural response. We, we shouldn't look away from that. It's just mm -hmm. uh, how it is sometimes. But again, uh, to be sincere about walking on this spiritual path, uh, actually job for people like us and everyone who are watching is to be genuine and stay strong on the path uh, isn't mm -hmm. it? instead of, um, let's say, being very reactive towards other people's behavior yeah that's our responsibility and that's one of the more difficult things and that's what it says in this chapter right the sage looks on those who have forgot the Tao with compassion mm -hmm. and there's a warning for the followers of Tao in the sense that if you only praise the good and disdain the bad right you are more confused than I than both the good and the bad whereas in life, there are those who have woken up and there are those who are still, in air quotes, asleep, who haven't realized the Tao or, or Brahman, whatever tradition you're from. And they just don't know. It doesn't mean they're bad people. No. But you may, the problem and that this chapter highlights is that you may assume they're bad people mm. because they just don't know the way. And that means that you are the most confused person. Right. Right. Yeah, we sometimes often make a mistake of look down on that sort of people. But again, that you being in confusion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all about to uh, actually transcend from that perspective, stay rise above yeah. and look at more sort of impartial, again, bigger perspective on things. It's... Uh, that kind of uh, individuals who are not aware of uh, following what it's like to follow in the Tao mm. is also part of, again, this crux of mystery. Exactly. And some, I mean, we we do realize a lot of the times that when we encounter that kind of people or a certain situation, it sometimes it uh, guides us to go further in the in the path mm -hmm. it helps us to go forward yeah it helps us to give more lessons mm. Mm. exactly the sage doesn't shun mm. anyone from coming to learn from them yeah they welcome all and because they are a vessel of the Tao. As the Tao Te Ching says, the Tao loves and nourishes all but does not lord it over them. And that's how, exactly how the sage is. They love and nourish all but don't lord it over them. But in saying that, because the sort of the law of magnetism or law of gravity or whatever you want to call it, only those who are really interested will seek out the sage. Mm. And that's kind of something they mentioned in this chapter too. You know, it's not like that the sage is like a evangelical Christian walking around trying to Pious, righteous. Pious and, and, and handing out pamphlets down the street trying to convert people. It's much more of a humble and honest mm -hmm. non-conversion path where only those who are ready will seek out the master or will discover the master in some sense. Mm -hmm. But the master is not 
doesn't mean that they actively go out there and, and you know, belittle no. other people. Now, but you don't want to exaggerate that too. A lot of Westerners will take that statement too literal. Like, for example, a monastery we went to, have been to, um, the master there would say, you know, if you're here because of this and that, and if you want to engage in monkey mind here, then you can go back out into the world and hang with the monkeys. <laughs> and we all laughed. But there's a certain group of people, maybe they're too geared towards social justice or they take things too literal or just don't have a sense of humour. They, they get really offended by that. Oh, you, you said that. Oh, like, oh, you're a master monk. Yeah, you're a master monk. How can you say that? And I've had that on posts before where I've said, I used the word comical about the word, about the world. And someone said, oh, that's a little arrogant, don't you think? Or... And it's, it's like, it's just a post. And it's not that I'm condemning the world. It's just the word comical. Like things are pretty funny in the world sometimes. And if you don't see that, then you're probably just blind to the world. Mm. And so you don't want to take that too literal because the, the, the master and the sage have to point things out about the world to those who are sincere in following the path. Otherwise... People will go to a monastery, for example, and walk back out of there the same as they walked in there. And that means that <laughs> it's defeated the purpose of you even going there. A wasted time. A wasted time. So the master's responsibility is to reiterate to you the ills of society and actually how comical the world can be at times. Now, that doesn't mean that that master doesn't have compassion for the world. Their humor actually is compassion. Yes. That's where people get it wrong. Yes. Their humor is actually compassion because they can be lighthearted about yes. it. They're not on the podium like calling for justice and, and calling for uh, ordinary people to suffer at the hands of spiritual people. It's just making light humor about the way society kind of has evolved. And also that's just a light uh, observation too, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like mm -hmm. you don't, not taking it too serious. And that's just expression of uh, sages caring yep. for the world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Those who go deeper on the spiritual path are usually those who have a more of an ease and lightness about their heart. And that's why a lot of social justice worries and that never survive because, you know, Eastern spirituality especially exposes social justice as being another subjective agenda fueled system of thinking mm -hmm. that a lot of people haven't thought about. And so if you're really sincere about the spiritual path, you can't be vexed by those problems. And I've mentioned on the podcast before, I mentioned 13 years ago at a satsang where someone posed M Muji with those questions because they just didn't understand Advaita Vedanta. Imagine if you didn't, if you look at Advaita Vedanta and you think, that this path of non-dualism should be a path of social justice. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. And that's why Muji said, if you are vexed by these problems, then you're never going to understand the nature of reality. And there's a place for that. There are places for social justice and this and that, but it doesn't commingle with Eastern spirituality because Eastern spirituality is the full stop. It's the end of the line. Yes. When you come to this, it's the end of the line. So <laughs> it's as people used to say to Ramana Maharshi when they used to go and see him, they would say, I'm here for you to finish me off. And a lot of people would say that like because they were so exhausted from trying to change the world or trying to change their family and they knew deep down they were the problem, mm -hmm. not the people they were trying to change and this and that. Yeah. Those people out there were suffering from the same hypnosis mm. from trying to change the world so if we all stop trying to change the world according to how we think the world is shanti yes and that's where eastern spirituality is a full stop mm. end of the line dot mm. exclamation point mm. i mean people see what's going on around the world and easily get confused uh, by those people's agenda and everyone has their own opinion so most cases when one agenda arises then there's a the other agenda arises which is opposed to opposing to that 
this agenda and they start fighting with each other and what's right or wrong and they try to prove a point but the other agenda which arises opposed to this agenda which was existed beforehand mm. is actually in the end doing the same thing as what this agenda was doing anyway in the end exactly. but that's what a lot of people are so uh, somewhat blind by what they are what they are supporting the the agenda they are supporting right yep. in the end they all become what they were fighting for mm. fighting against mm. So again, the answer is to be neither, really. Mm. To to jump out of that game, yep. to get out of the re- just say no, just just uh, take retirement from that playing that sort of game, <laughs> and yeah, just it's it's neither, and just trying to stay away from such argument, really, yep. isn't it? And come back to that. Going back to that, um, that still point, having no agenda, and but to see the world as it truly is without having a partial opinion. Yep. Partiality is a problem. That mm. causes all the problems in the world. And you know, we always get a few people who will comment on this and are not really listening to what we are saying. Mm. If we're all going around with a partial view, when does it end? And so that's why Eastern spirituality is a full stop. I always think of Eastern spirituality as the oneness project. You know, we humanity is always geared towards oneness, but we are our own enemy. So we will have our partial perspective of the world, we'll project that onto the world. And then when someone comes along with this type of enlightened knowledge, then they will say, well, how is that going to fix all these problems? And it's like, well, how are your partial views of the world going to contribute to the millions of other partial views that are contributing to all of the problems in the world? This is the oneness project. And you are either on board or you are contributing to the partial, to the chaos and destruction of the world and humanity. And so it's a choice. It's a choice. And we all have a choice. To, and you can continue to follow that path if you want and you can become a social justice warrior but you will definitely find no peace Mm. in that path Mm. and it's far better to have peaceful people in the world than to have insane people in the world and so now is the time to make that choice Mm. are you one who knows the Tao is coming back into harmony with the Tao or are you in this sense willfully forgetting the Tao because you know about it, mm. but your sense of morality and your sense of, in some sense, entitlement of how you think the world should be mm. is eclipsing mm. your choice to come into harmony with the Tao. Mm. And that's the role for all of us. And that's why Taoism ultimately is an amoral path, not to mention Buddhism and Hinduism as well. So. Well said. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. We'll see you guys next time.